Okay. Hello and happy Monday to everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for a Facebook Live update from the MAC Fund as well as Children's Wisconsin and the Medical College of, of Wisconsin. Just a reminder, everybody is muted at this point and please use the chat room for any questions you may have. So just a couple of updates um, from the Mac Fund side of things. Um, Candy Cane Lane was a huge success this year for the Mac Fund. Over $207,000 was raised. So thanks to the committee, thanks to all the volunteers, everybody that came through and donated, we are so grateful. Two Sundex once again came through for the MAC Fund, raising over $176,000 for us through MAC Star Sales, Candy, cane Lane, candy Canes, um, Roundup, um, and just everything that they do to help promote the MAC Fund. We are so grateful for Sundex um, and their continued partnership. Lucky Leprechaun was virtual this year. We are once again grateful for all those who took part in the virtual Lucky Leprechaun and helped raise money for the MAC Fund. We're also grateful for Vision Management who continues to partner with, with the MAC Fund. The ELB, the Emerging Leader Board, had a, a blood drive about a week and a half ago and they had a full day of folks that have stepped up to the plate and donated blood which as everybody knows is uh, very crucial and critical um, to these kids. Um, so thank you for, for that. The Radiothon, Bob and Brian, once again, uh, over $56,000 was raised for us. We look forward to the Bob and Brian golf outing at Grand Geneva, uh, the end of July. And a member for a day um, was just fantastic and raised quite a bit of money for the MAC Fund as well. So thanks to everybody who continues to participate, to donate, and to just to help the MAC Fund. Um, we are grateful for everybody that continues to help raise money to fight pediatric cancer and related blood disorders, and the continued money that goes to Children's Wisconsin, the Medical College of Wisconsin, UW Carbone, as well as Marshfield to help in the fight and help support research in the fight against uh, childhood cancer and blood disorders. Upcoming events uh, to possibly get involved in. April 17th is the MSOE Smashing Childhood Cancer, cancer Virtual Event. Um, you can donate, you can participate, uh, you can register online for that. Um, April 29th is The Ringer. You can donate to The Ringer, you can support a golfer. Um, whatever um, your means, um, help us reach a million dollars for the ringer this year. In May, there is National Cancer Research Month. Um, we will be hosting a fundraiser for that and we will feature researchers and projects that they are working on um, during the month of May. May 8th is the Aaron Hills MAC Fund Invitational. It is high school golfers looking at raising money to help the MAC Fund and have the opportunity to play at Aaron Hills, which is one of the premier golf courses. So thanks to all the kids, all the coaches, the committee that continues to help fundraise um, and again, help the MAC Fund through this event. May 22nd is an Alley Cats car show being held at Sprecher. Um, there's a $10 entrance fee. You can sign up the day of um, for that event. You can enjoy Sprecher soda, drinks, food trucks, raffles, and there will be prizes for all those cars um, and folks that participate. Last is the Truck 100, which is going to be August 22nd. We know that there will 
absolutely be a virtual component to it, but we are also hoping um, that we will um, be live at the Trek headquarters um, this year as well. So mark your calendars for August 21st. Um, get on your bikes, start preparing for any distance, um, 162, 39, 36, excuse me, or the 19 mile. Uh, weather is looking good, so hop on your bikes and start fundraising for the MAC Fund. And last but not least, the MAC Fund Open is August 30th at Tuckaway. And ZT Distribution is the presenting sponsor this year for the MAC Fund Open. So we are grateful um, to Scott and his team for stepping up to the plate and, and helping the MAC Fund. So once again, we are grateful um, for everybody that is in attendance for this Facebook Live um, meeting today. Um, thank you for your continued support and participation. And now, as I'm being reminded, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat room. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Giuliani, who is the Service Line Executive Director for the Mac Fund Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders, as well as Dr. Cindy Schwartz, who is the Professor of Pediatrics, as well as the Section Chief of Pedi Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, and Stem Cell Transplantation at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Children's Wisconsin. So thank you both for being here. And um, they will give you an update as to how the MAC fund monies and support is impacting the research at, again, the Medical College and Children's Wisconsin. So thank you both for being here. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, Becky. Thank you for inviting Dr. Schwartz and I to provide updates this morning. Uh, as you had introduced, I'm Lauren Giuliani. I'm a service line executive director over at Children's Wisconsin at the MAC fund center there. And I'm joined today with Oh, Dr. Cindy Schwartz. Hi, I'm glad to be here this morning. Wonderful. You know, we consider the MAC Fund organization part of our family here at Children's Wisconsin. Uh, so we're looking forward to sharing some of the work we've been doing recently in our fight against childhood cancer and blood disorders. And it goes without saying that everyone's world has been turned upside down this past year. And it's been humbling to see the Mac Fund community continue to support our shared mission. You had talked a little bit about Candy Cane Lane, uh, Becky. I was uh, lucky enough to, to be able to find a time where I could actually get through. It was so busy. Um, and, and I shared with Becky um, that, you know, I, I got misty eyed just driving through and knowing that so many members of our community came through and uh, got to see some wonderful lights displayed, but also supported uh, our kids with cancer and blood disorders. It was, it was incredible uh, for me to participate in it. And just thank you to, to the entire uh, community to, for supporting those types of events, despite uh, the unknowns that we all have been facing over the past year. And despite the world slowing down, um, kids were still diagnosed with cancer and blood disorders this past year. And I am so proud of our team here at Children's Wisconsin and centers across the country uh, that we continue to provide excellent care to kids despite those challenges. And I'm also so proud of our families within this program. If you think of the stress and worry a family faces when a child is diagnosed with cancer in any other time, it's only magnified during a viral pandemic. Uh, yet our families have continued to be incredible partners in care and have been supportive and understanding of the restrictions and requests we've put in place to keep everyone safe. So the childhood cancer community was always great. We all know that, especially if you're on this live right now. Uh, but Dr. Schwartz and I agree, it's now truly exemplary after everything we've been through in this past uh, year. So I wanna talk about a couple of questions that I typically get asked. Um, so the first question we're often asked is, what have we done to keep our hospital environment safe for immunocompromised patients uh, and for our staff and providers and researchers? And the answer is quite a lot actually. Um, so our first challenge was to keep our team and our environment safe so we can keep providing excellent care. And we did that through a couple of different ways. Of course, PPE is a word that I think everyone now knows of personal protective equipment. Uh, so we all have, you know, our masks and our goggles and uh, gowns and gloves. Um, of course, we have environmental cleaners like sanitizing wipes. We've got hand sanitizers, gallons and gallons of it. 
Um, and I want to share with this, uh, this community here that thanks to our incredible supply chain team and our community partners, we were able to provide masks to our team, our patients, and our families consistently throughout the last year. So you might have seen on news agencies or other outlets, you know, that it was difficult to uh, have masks, especially right when the pandemic hit. And although it was challenging for us because most of our supply chain did, um, uh, did was impacted, we were able to provide N95 masks uh, early last spring for everyone in our environment. Uh, we've been able to provide cloth masks for uh, visitors who, who might not have them. Um, thanks to partnerships with local businesses who are, who are supporting us, it truly was all hands on deck. And that's why we were able to, to provide consistent PPE for our, our staff and for our patients and for our families and providers. So um, I have been uh, on campus as has Dr. Schwartz the majority of this past year. Um, and I have felt safe. So I think that's an important message for, for our community to hear because of course it's due to our organization's planning and excellent supply chain um, members, but also uh, because of our partnership with, with community members like many who are on, on the phone here today. So thank you. Um, we've also been able to keep our environment safe. Uh, so uh, within the Mac Fund Center, when we care for immunocompromised patients, we typically have something called um, positive pressure air or more air exchanges uh, than what you would see in a normal office environment or where you, when you go to your doctor's office. And we've been able to maintain that uh, to keep our kids safe. Um, and we put in some additional HEPA filters to make sure that there aren't any additional uh, viruses floating around in our air. We've also done a lot to keep our environment safe, limiting visitors. This has been a tough one for us, uh, especially when kids are facing cancer and blood disorders diagnoses. We need our community here to support us, but we have had to limit visitors to keep our environment safe. Um, and that, like I said, it's been, it's been challenging, but it's been pretty effective as well so that we um, are able to continue providing care in our environment. We've also required masks for everyone, patients, families, staff, providers, whenever you're in the Mac Fund Center or in Children's Wisconsin, any campus we do require masks and that's been effective at keeping our environment safe. And then we've also been able to use testing uh, for patients on admission um, or before a surgical procedure. So uh, they are COVID uh, tested so that we know um, if we need to take additional precautions. And again, just keep our immunocompromised patients safe wherever they are. Additionally, I want to thank our team because we've been screening patients and families uh, for any COVID symptoms before they come to the Mac Fund Center here at Children's. Um, and if they do have any uh, positive signs and symptoms of illness, we've got a special unit staffed by Mac Fund Center staff and providers separate from where the patients without symptoms are treated uh, so that they can continue to receive care and we keep um, any chance of, of passing that between our patients uh, minimized. And of course, it's, it's the hot topic right now, Becky, uh, but we've been able to uh, secure vaccinations as well. So all of our staff and providers were offered vaccinations starting back in December. So uh, we've had our vaccinations here for a while. Um, and then we've been offering to appropriate patients, so those that are over 16 and without any uh, contraindications uh, this spring, as well as care providers for our patients uh, so that we can continue to, to protect our patients um, within the COVID environment. So uh, we have done a lot to keep our, our patients safe. Um, and that leads to probably the second question that might be on your mind. Uh, uh, are, are patients with cancer and blood disorders getting COVID? And the answer is unfortunately, yes. Um, within Wisconsin here, uh, we have had an extremely high uh, prevalence rate as uh, labeled by the, the CDC. I think we might be back down to high, so that's exciting. Um, uh, but we have had it in the community and therefore our patients who don't have as strong an immune system as most other people um, have, um, have gotten COVID. But the good news is, is that most are not uh, as severe as we see in the adult population. So I think that's, a, again, another important message for this team to, to hear is that we're able to um, uh, support our patients who have COVID um, and keep them safe. So what we are seeing is that um, it takes longer for our patients to recover uh, from the virus. So most adults uh, stop testing positive and shedding the virus within a week or two of getting their positive result. And our patients can continue to test positive for longer durations, um, sometimes even months. Uh, so we are again creating safe environments uh, for our patients to continue to receive uh, care and treatment despite uh, that diagnosis. 
So um, I'm not sure if there were any additional uh, questions that came in about uh, our current situation, but I think it was uh, important for us to update on how we've kept everybody safe and we've been able to continue to provide excellent care uh, with some adjustments over this past year. So now I want to hand the call over to uh, Dr. Schwartz, our section chief, uh, to talk about research and other exciting updates. Okay. And I thank you, Lauren. And I think I'll continue just on the COVID issue because it impacted both all of the staff at the hospital, impacted our kids. We still have to cover and make sure we're providing care, sometimes off the MAC fund unit for, to keep kids who are positive safe. And also once a child has it, they have an isolation period and the parents have an isolation period. So it becomes a real struggle for the families to get through this. And so I think we've I think we've done a good job supporting the families through all of this and we're not done yet. It's still ongoing, obviously. The other side of it on the research is that when this first, when everything shut down back in March, the laboratory shut down because we also didn't want our investigators to get sick or to spread it to everybody around. And so originally most of the laboratories unless they were working on the coronaviruses were shut down. Over time, there was probably about a three month period that we call the hibernation period where the labs were shut down. And then they came back into vogue and we started bringing people back with various ways of making sure that the laboratories weren't packed. So people, the staff were coming in some in the mornings and some at nights really to keep the right research effort going. And that has continued to this day. And so our research effort in the laboratories is going on the same way. At the clinical research level, which really is where the MAC fund also plays a large role for us. we. Many places if you read the papers talk about how clinical research stopped. But because our clinical research for the most part, the, the therapy-based research is so critical for the saving lives of these kids, we were able to keep all of our, almost all of our studies going other than some that were more observational or things like exercise, but anything that had to do with therapy for the cancers continued. So all the COG efforts and all the clinical trials that people are running all stayed open during this period and new ones were processed. So if you were to look at our numbers in terms of kids who went on therapies and how we treated them, really there was very little change over this period for us. And that's good because it meant the kids in terms of their ability to get cured didn't really change at all. And that's the exciting part. Now, a lot of our clinical trial organization that you guys so generously support, many of them learned a new way of working where much of the work, the regulatory submitting protocols to IRBs and getting the approvals to do them, people did a lot of that work and still do a lot of that work from home. But there are every day, at least one of them is assigned to come in for anything that needs hands-on care or specimens that need to get shipped off the laboratory somewhere. So we worked like the rest of the world, we worked at a new system where we start to segregate our work to what work can we do sitting at our homes on the computers and where, are, do, what days do we come in? When do we show up to make sure we're there for our families? And that was made our clinical research work. And honestly, we did it with our clinical service too. If it was your clinical day, if you were on service, if you had a sick patient, you went in. But if you were going to be writing a paper that day or reading the literature or planning a therapy and working on your computer, you could do that wherever you wanted. And so like the rest of the workforce, we have adjusted how we do this and we continue to adjust. So fortunately, the research has kept going for the most part during this period. And we've also been lucky that the institution has realized that we honestly needed more faculty to do all the things we need to do, the clinical work, the research work. And so while a lot of our field hasn't had jobs open for people coming out. Um, no, but we have been able to both keep all of our faculty and our nurses and our nurse practitioners and all the people who work with us really have not, but there was a short period where people were what was called, some people were furloughed where they stayed home but got pay. But that all those people have come back. We have not lost personnel. And we've been really excited to welcome a bunch of new faculty who really add to our program. So on the transplant side, we've been particularly blessed by working with the CIBMTR, and that's a lot of letters, but it's the group that keeps track of how people all around the country and beyond the country as well do with their bone marrow transplants. It's an organization that works for both 
It's the transplant registry. So it gets all the data for people who've been transplanted and it's located right here in medical college. And so we have worked with that group and together we've hired two new physicians for that. One was intended to be a pediatric one and one, the best candidate, it was a pediatric bone marrow transplant. So we have two new pediatric bone marrow transplant physicians who have joined our group during this year. One is Dr. Um, Kristen Page, who's come from Duke, and she is moving in right now. We see her all the time on Zoom, but she's not quite here. I don't know if she's quite here physically yet, but she um, came from Duke. She did a lot of the survivorship work. She's an amazing transplanter, and we're really excited for her work here. And the other is our own Amy Moskop, who was one of our fellows in this year working on transplants and is really focused on the immuno-oncology which I, I know you guys have heard about over time. It's really one of the major parts of the future of how we treat people. It's beginning to change our reliance on these toxic therapies and radiation therapy and begin to figure out how to stimulate the immune system to cure cancer. And so that's really her mission. And she's working both within our division and with the CIBMTR and looking at how a lot of the children who've been getting these novel therapies that you've heard about all around the country are doing. So, really exciting moving ahead in the transplant service. And we need it desperately because you all know Dave Margolis and we all know how he wants to do everything, but he is still one person and he can't be on service past the year and be the interim chair of pediatrics. So having the new people to help us, number one, gives him time to do some of that work. And number two, brings in new people with new knowledge, new ideas and new ways of doing things. So transplant service is really up and running and great. The oncology service, I think we finally convinced the institution that our oncologists probably work harder than anybody with the number of kids on the service and all the other projects people are trying to do to improve the care. And so we have been approved to hire a new physician taking care of kids with leukemia and lymphoma. And we, I don't think they've signed on the dotted line yet, but they're, they were, um, I'll say his name, he's coming. Doc, Dr. Zach Graff is coming, unless something really changes. And he's bringing with him, or his wife is bringing him, or he's bringing his wife, but she's an infectious disease specialist for the hospital. So it's a two for one that's really great for our program. And he in particular has worked on some of the therapies with using CAR T cells against some of the leukemias, called some of the baby leukemias that the little tiny babies get that's a devastating leukemia. And he worked with a guy named Terry Fry, who I worked with at Hopkins. And Terry is like the, one of the top-notch people in the country on this kind of immunotherapy. So we're really excited to have Zach join us with all of that knowledge. Um, we are also hiring a second physician for the children with brain tumors. A couple of years ago, we brought Dr. Tanaka in and he's been managing somehow. And I think it's because he must sleep three hours a night but he has been running his research lab with Dr. Medine, trying to look at proteins and how you attack brain tumors with CAR T cells and things like that. And at the same time, he's been taking care of 50, 60 new patients with brain tumors and planning their therapy. So he needs help. And we're pretty sure we have a, a physician from Chicago who has also told me she's signing on the dotted line, Dr. Rumler. So we're looking forward to her coming as well. And both of these individuals should be here this summer. They're both graduating their fellowships and will be starting with us. We are also in the process of recruiting an oncology program director. When I got here to run really hematology, oncology and bone marrow transplant, I was also running the oncology program and I still am for the most part. And I've enlisted in some of our faculty to help because it's a big program. But I think we need, just like we have a head of BMT and we have a head of hematology, we're going to have a head of oncology. So there's three people who are senior leaders in the field running each of our three sections with me to help all of them thinking where we go and what the next step is for our field. So we're excited to start that recruitment as well. Um, we also put in for somebody to help us with another physician for quality to really keep track of all of our quality projects. If there's a problem somewhere to make sure we fix it, to look for all those things that make sure the safety of our patients. And it's become actually a field where we do research and we do a lot of it here. We, we really provide incredibly safe care, but because we're so busy, we don't have time 
right now to have somebody who keeps track of all these great things we're doing. And it's important for us because we know, but we also want to tell the world when we come up with a new way to keep kids safe, we want to make sure we're telling the world because so that it's not just the kids in Wisconsin who are safe, it's the kids elsewhere. And that we're communicating in case somebody has found something in New York that's safer, let us have a specialist who's keeping her ear to the ground and making sure that she hears all the new things to bring back to Wisconsin. So it looks like the, the leadership of the hospital is interested in this and making sure we have that coverage. So we're very excited with four new people should be coming in for the oncology service over the next year. And that will free all of us to both give incredible care. And also many of us haven't had time to do the research we wanna do because patient care has to come first but we also want to advance the care. And now we will really have the right balance, I think, in care and research and really making this program what it has to be and what it can be. So I'm really excited. Hematology, I'm also going to mention because you, you're, the back fund has supported our sickle cell research, our hemophilia research, and we are in the midst of leadership change. Now you have heard of Dr. Panapinto, who's a national leader in sickle cell disease. And maybe I'm saying this a little prematurely, but she has become, gotten a major do job as an associate, I believe an associate director, I might have the wrong title on that, at the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute. So it's a major, major responsibility nationally for sickle cell disease and the hematology field. But we are also going to, Dr. Flood is going to take over a lot of that work. She is a major leader in hemophilia nationally, and we are recruiting at least one new person and maybe and a, probably a second as well. So we are moving ahead with our hematology team. One of the people we are very much hoping will be coming does immunohematology. So you keep hearing me talk about immunology. We are across our field, we're learning about the immune system. And one of the people who I think is going to sign on the dotted line is an immunohematologist and going to set up a major program for us to deal with a lot of the immunologic disorders that we see in our hematology. Program. And so that will expand us. We've been national leaders in sickle cell disease and in hemophilia and clotting. And now we will also have this third aspect of our hematology program. So I'm excited about that. The other thing that really has been excited at our institution across the board is the cancer center. And I think many of you know that about a year ago now, um, Gustavo Leone came to be our new director of our cancer center. And he's brought with him a lot of energy of how do we develop our cancer center, both to get NIH funding eventually, but also to build it up so that we deserve the NIH funding. We do, it will be really important to have a cancer center for the entire Wisconsin population and to make sure we're serving the population. But he's, and what he's done is a very thoughtful approach on where do we focus, not just who has a grant that brings in a million dollars or whatever, but what are the strengths we have and what do we bring to the community and what do we bring to the world of cancer? And two of the major areas that he's thinking about are three. One primary one is this immuno-oncology. So not only have we been focused on it with the CAR T cells and some of the NK cells that we've been working on with our patients, but we're, it's coming from the cancer center itself. And when I got here, although the cancer center was here and I was on some of the committees and some of our people were involved in it in various ways, we were not as integrated as part of it. Although really our cancer research, because of the strengths that the Mac Fund brought to this program over the last 40 years, we are really a major part of this campus for cancer, if not the, the plum part of the cancer and what we do. And so they have really brought us in. Dr. Leone has asked me to be in as one of the associate directors of the Cancer Center, focusing both on survivorship because we have such a strong survivorship program, but also looking at survivorship across the board. Our children graduate and become adults and need care. And they're also young adults and people who need good survivorship care. And the more we do it together, the better it is for everybody. And also for pediatrics overall, like how do we build our pediatric program? So we are working much more in partnership with them. And so we are very excited about that. And I know he has a number of recruits that he's intending to recruit in immunohematology, oncology. And some of those people are going to be interested in pediatric diseases. We've already hired 
as a joint hire between the Cancer Center Cell Biology and Pediatrics, a young PhD who's focused on um, cancer stem cells and neuroblastoma. So again, we build our scientific strength with partnerships across the, can the Cancer Center and, the, and MCW. So really excited integration with the Cancer Center and more to come. And there's a whole new cancer research building going up where one of our faculty, one of our fellows who's graduating will probably ultimately end up in three or four years. Right now he's at Versity, but he probably end up in the Cancer Center laboratories so that he can really interact with people who may take care of adult cancers, but that they're relevant to the pediatric cancer world. So really exciting with all this. Now talking a little bit about some of the projects you have known over the years and you've supported over the years, I just wanna update you on all of them. I think you know that we've talked about our genomic and epigenomic therapies. And those are the therapies where we try to understand what's wrong in the genome and either fix the genetics of a disease or through the DNA, the real basic backbone of our genetics or what's called the epigenome, which is the, the proteins around the DNA that makes parts of the DNA turn on and off. Because you know, And that's that epigenetics is where Dr. Burke has worked in his leukemia therapies for a while. And we have some really exciting projects that he's been doing that he's brought to the whole country through his tackle work which is a consortium of people who deal with childhood leukemia. Um, Dr. Berkham and Dean are also working to genetically change leukemia cells so that they actually make something called IL-12 that makes, stimulates the immune system to, count, to affect cancer or leukemia. And that study is really at the brink of opening now. We've been talking about it for years, but I really think this is the year that it's going to actually open really hope so and that we're going to start treating children with this novel way of treating and we're and i don't even hadn't even mentioned that i was going to say it but dr schlamer for sarcomas is talking about doing the same thing for osteosarcoma once we make this work with leukemia so this is a really novel way of treating and nobody else is doing anything like this where you actually take the child's cancer cell and change it so that it stimulates the immune response it's really a very cool way of doing it so more to come on that. Um, now, Dr. Wilcox, I think some of you know, has figured out a better way of treating hemophilia. He's taken the, the correct way of making the hemophilia protein and put it into the cells so that they are, they make the protein right where they're needed. When you, when you get a cut, your platelets go to heal the bleeding. And he has put it, this novel, the corrected protein, the, the corrected hemophilia protein back into the platelets. So it doesn't float around in the bloodstream. It always sits in the platelets and they bring it right to the site of bleeding and fix it. And that study has finally opened nationally. The first adults are going on it. And once a few adults are on, we'll get some kids on that study too. And we're gonna start with the kids with the worst hemophilia who already don't respond to the regular factors that we give because they have all kinds of antibody, but this will fool all that because all those antibodies will be floating around in those people's bloodstream and it won't matter a bit because those platelets are going to carry the right proton, the right hemophilia factor right to the place it's needed. And so it'll work with these people who are really, we think it'll work with these people who are really in trouble now, but it will ultimately be a much better way for all the people with hemophilia. And Dr. Shi also is funded for genetic therapy in the same area. So there are dynamic duo really working with hemophilia. And immunotherapy. Boy, I'm running out of being able to talk. There's so many things going on. I just keep <laughs> talking about all this and spieling about all the great things going on. Um, I can take a breath for a second if anybody has any questions before I go into the immunotherapy. I see a couple of things in the chat, actually. Um, there is a question um, regarding there seems to be a spike in children that are being diagnosed and what is, be, what is behind that change? Um, I don't think we really know. If you look at our numbers, they're not changing that much. As a matter of fact, recently we were beginning to wonder, they were a little bit lower in the last couple of months and we were beginning to come up with, could the lack of viral stimulation be actually protecting our children? I don't know when people talk about a 1% increase sometimes of childhood leukemia in particular is where I've heard it. I, 
don't know what that's about, really. I think that there are fluctuations sometimes to years where there's influenza that's very rampant. Sometimes a year or two later, the babies who are born during the influenza, when influenza was around, when they were in utero, a couple of years later, they may be a little bit higher risk of leukemia. Um, we're a little bit curious this year with COVID where kids are really in isolation. And just like all the rest of us, I don't know, I could ask all of you, when's the last time you had a cold, one of those really bad winter colds? We are not getting it so much. Um, and is that changing the immune stimulation? I think this will, this is an unfortunate period, but I think we'll also learn a lot about what happens and how, what happens when people are stimulated, young children, when their immune systems are developing, if they don't get the same stimulation, not of the COVID, but of the other viruses too, all the routine things that kids get. If they don't get stimulated, are they going to have more leukemia down the road or less? We don't really know. So we're really watching like a hawk and I don't think we understand it. I really do hope it goes away. I'd love, I'd love to go out and get out of a job, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what are we all? That's our, that's our end goal. You know, all these kids, if they don't get sick, I can go and sit in the sun, be good. <laughs> <laughs> another question or? We do have another question. It says, I know that Children's Wisconsin is prioritizing and working to address mental health issues with our Wisconsin children. Due to the traumatic nature of treatment, is there any type of research and or connection between Children's Wisconsin and MAC Fund going on or planned to look at psychosocial effects of treatment on the children and teens? We've been really blessed with a really strong team of psychologists. We have three psychologists and most years actually have a, a fellow in training. So usually it's four people in our team really focused on psych psychological aspects of the care of our children, of their families, how they, how they deal with the stress, how they deal with getting through this and things that also impact their, their understanding of their disease. Kristen Bingham has studies of comp compliance with their medicines and how, to, how does she help them through the stress so they understand and take their medicines. Um, but we also have people looking at what we can do to support them. We have really strong support for our patients. Our kids who are at the highest risk all get psychology consults from the very, very beginning of their therapy. Not just the children, but the parents so that we understand what's going on in the family because it's, we don't really just treat a child. We really treat the whole family going through this experience. And if there's a father at home who's depressed, it, it affects the family. It affects the mother and the child who are fearful for this sad father at home. And sometimes I, I actually have one patient who I, I still have not actually met the father. And yet we have to work with the child and the mother because he can't even grapple with what's happening to his child. And so these things are critical to making sure we get the families through this, through the, the hard part of it when they're in treatment. And we also know that there's impact later as they enter survivorship of understanding when they were, some of these kids, when they were three, they didn't know what this meant. They went, they got treated and all that. And sometimes these kids hit 18 or 20 and they look back and said, oh, I'm not the same as the other children who've been perfectly healthy. I am someone who almost died. And, and they sometimes look at a form of post-traumatic stress years after that we have, that our psychologists work with. So we, we do work with all of this. We have groups for the teens because we know they grapple with illness differently, whether they're in treatment or it's five, 10 years out and they're suddenly thinking that they're different from others. We all know that teenagers want to be like their buddies and they may not be the same. They may, if they're in treatment, they may not have the strength. They may have lost their hair, their face may be puffy and all of this is exactly what you don't wanna be as a teen. So it's, it is critical. Within the institution, we've also changed the support for our psychology team. And we have now developed a new division specifically for the psychologists around children's. 
and I'm forgetting the exact name of that division, behavior, Laura, do you remember the name of this new division? Anyway, don't. <laughs> it has a new name, but it's all the psychologists that grapple with all the children with chronic disease and all the children, even the, the children with mental health issues, but they put the psychologists under one division to make sure that they're not just communicating with us oncologists, but they're also bringing the best of their field to each specific area. So I think we're really moving ahead on how we really deliver this best care. And I would just add um, to that, Dr. Schwartz, that we, right now we're focused on treatment. Uh, we do know that our patients are experiencing more need for, for psychologists than they had in the past. We're seeing that in volumes. Um, and we're also hearing that from our families that even, even you know, just the, the pre-surgical COVID swabs, if you've ever had one, they're not comfortable. But if you've had one when you've got mucositis because of chemotherapy, it's, it's even more challenging. And we're seeing more struggles pop up like that. So right now we're focusing on treatment. And as Dr. Schwartz mentioned, you know, the research on, on trauma typically happens after the fact. And we're just, we're poised for that because we have such strong um, psychologist researchers within a program. But at the MAC Fund, uh, center and, and with the MAC Fund, you know, we're working to tell the stories of uh, family members through, uh, you know, MAC um, feature stories, super sim blogs, parent experiences. Uh, so if you or anyone you know would like to share, you know, we'd like to hear from you as well so you, we can highlight your voice now. Just know that every day, <laughs> 24 hours a day, we are here and we are supporting our families through the, the trauma that is happening right now. And, and they actually manage this through COVID, even through video visits and all that. So we've done very well with all that. Um, I think I'll move on to the immunotherapy because I want to let you know that Dr. Tolano's study with the CAR T cells with the CD19 and 20 is now coming to children. And we are open for children and we're looking forward to bringing this, this really exciting therapy that attacks two of the proteins on leukemia cells um, at the same time. And it's novel, nobody else has this in the country. So we're hoping not only to treat our kids, but hopefully kids around the country. So that's a really exciting step. Um, Dr. Medine, who is the MAC Fund professor, is working with me actually, um, because I'm interested in Hodgkin lymphoma. And he's developed an antibody specific for Hodgkin lymphoma. Now there is one out on the market and it's made a big difference, but the one he developed is probably a stronger antibody than the one that's out there. And so we are looking to bring it to patients and we're working on that this year. Um, Dr. Burke and Phelan and Drs. Phelan have come up with a, not a way of treating or have a study for treating, getting kids to transplant with linitumumab, which is a commercial antibody, but we're using it. And we know from some of the COG studies that it's much less toxic and at least as effective. And so we, they are working with Amgen, the pharmaceutical company, to really study this. And that has opened at our institution this year. So a lot has happened even during COVID. That study has opened. And we have both Dr. Ryuma Tanaka and Nate Schlamer working on developing CAR T cells and antibodies that are specific for brain tumors and solid tumors, which is all a whole new field of immunotherapy. We, we've been hearing a lot about leukemia, lymphoma, mostly where the cancer cells are floating around in the bloodstream. And it's a different world when they're in a lump, which is what the solid tumors are. And they're working on how we're gonna do that. So we're really looking forward to their work. Um, and uh, let's see, I mentioned Kristen Bingham's compliance. And we also have Veronica Flood, who's really gotten some funding from the MAC Fund to really focus on why young women tend to have more bleeding problems. And it particularly affects a lot of their menses and things like that. And so she, and they can really have serious bleeding. So she's looking at the Von Willebrand factor, which she's a national expert in and really looking. And she has a whole cohort of women, large group of women that she can look at and study what's really happening when these women have bleeding problems. So exciting times. This year, we're real, we are focusing to, I wanna let you know that we've talked a lot about how in 2016, before I got here, we lost our phase one contract with COG just because our numbers were a little borderline. And we have now been brought back into the phase one group. So we're really excited our kids are gonna get those new phase one drugs. Um, Dr. Burke put in an application and we got it. And so we are now again, a part of the phase one group in COG and that gives us more new drugs in addition to some of the groups we had 
entered when we weren't part of COG were still going to be part of tackle for leukemia. There's a SPAC, which is the Southwest Plains, but when Paul Harkimer moved from that area up here, he brought the plains up here. So we're part of SPAC. Um, so we have a lot of ways that we integrate with other groups around the country to bring these new drugs. And now being part of COG just gives us a lot of access. And we're looking forward to getting all those contracts open so we can give those drugs to the kids. Um, and all of this, it's not as exciting in terms of the glitz of a new drug and new therapy, but none of this could happen without the support you guys give us for this, our clinical trial organization. We, we can't responsibly do these trials unless we're keeping track of how each child does. And also knowing how the children all around the country are doing so that if something is wrong, we, we have our eyes open and we're watching our own patients too. So none of this could happen without the CTR and it's, critical and we are growing and we're adding new people to do that work because we can't, we can't get bogged down and miss an effect. And we want to have somebody's all these new protocols, we have to have people to submit them to the IRBs and do all of that work. So we're excited about that. Um, and I think Lauren was going to talk again about some of the other things that are going on. But before I do, I mean, we just highlighted at least 12 different research studies uh, within genomic and epigenetics, immunotherapy, hematology and bleeding, and then uh, psychology and the research in psychology. I wanted to pause to see if there were any questions about that. There is a question not regarding those specifically, but over the next 10 years, research in general, how does that look? And are you optimistic? I'm really optimistic. And I think there are two areas that are going to change how we treat kids. And I think we're really at the forefront of doing it. And some of the things we've started, number one, we've heard about the immune oncology. I think that will become a much more dominant part of standard therapy. I mean, I keep mm -hmm. hoping a child will come in with leukemia, will give a little bit of the standard old stuff to get the therapy down, and then we'll give them immunotherapy and be done. I don't know if that will happen, but it will eventually. We will have better therapies and I think this next decade is going to be exciting. The other thing which I guess I haven't talked about is the, what's called precision medicine. And that's where we're learning about what went wrong in a, somebody's cancer cell. And we figure out how to direct some of these new drugs directly to what's wrong in that person's cell. <clears throat> because a lot of these tumors look very similar under the microscope and we call them all Wilms tumor. We call them all Ewing sarcoma, but each person's cancer cell is different. And if we can learn what went wrong in that cell and give a couple of drugs that kind of turn off that bad pathway, we can change how we treat therapy. So instead of giving all these things that just cure our kids by killing the rapidly growing things and hopefully the good cells live, we can really hone in on the cell. And so we've actually started a program here um, led by Matt Kudek, who's just finishing our fellowship with Nate Schlamer, and I've been working with them to start this. And it's just starting with the major programs around the country that we do this, where we actually send off someone's cancer cell when we get it, and we send it off to a lab, and they figure out what's wrong with it. And so we can add these kind of new drugs right in and give them therapy that's really home to their disease. And that is going to be the future of pediatric oncology. And one thing that I'm hoping is that our new doctors coming up learn how to do this and really learn those pathways so that when they see a patient, they're immediately thinking that way. You know, people like me are used to all the old drugs and I know how to change them and the doses and which one gets which, but it's going to be a new world. It's going to be a world of these focus targeted therapies, whether it's immune or targeted to what's wrong in the cell. So we've started that program and we've got we're more part of phase one where these new drugs are going to be coming through. We started all these immuno oncology things. And we're also, we've started one other program, which I haven't mentioned much, but which is our cancer predisposition program, which we also started in the past year and is now seeing patients. And that's first for our kids some of whom we know have a risk for cancer built into their genome. And also people throughout Wisconsin who 
may still have cancer in their family and are saying, gee, are we at risk? Do we need to screen our people? Do we have to do something so we pick up a cancer when it's tiny? And we know that if we pick up some of these cancers when they're tiny, that we can cure people better. And so Dr. Bechtel is running this program. She is seeing kids now in her clinic. And pretty soon we're going to be sending letters to all the pediatricians around saying, hey, if somebody is worried that the cousin in Connecticut and that family has some bad cancer and they want to check their kid, we're going to be ready for them. And so really the future is from what we've learned in the research is bringing it to the clinic. And that's what's going to happen in this 10 years. And we're really excited about it. And we really can only do this with the help you guys have done. We've only gotten this far. We're only going to get that next decade because of the support of the MAC Fund in particular, as well as some of the other people in the community, but especially the MAC Fund. But I can't retire. I have to see this happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll hand the call back to you, Becky, to see if there's any additional questions uh, that we can answer. Not at this time. Okay, so Laura, do you want to talk about some of the exciting things that we're doing for our patients too? Well, we have so not much to sure. share. I'm not sure if we have time, Becky, you tell us. Let's, let's shoot for 11 o'clock. Okay, well, I can absolutely do that. I think Dr. Schwartz just highlighted some of the really exciting things and where we think the, the, the strategy is going on how to not only treat individual uh, cancers as well as uh, catch cancers early so they're easier to treat. Uh, for the patients who are already within our program, there's a couple of other things that we're doing um, that are associated with, with treatment as well as research that we think are really interesting to share. The first is on our fertility program. So uh, many people in the community understand that when chemotherapeutic agents or um, uh, other treatments are um, given to patients that it does impact uh, fertility, especially when children are so young. Um, and so what we've built here at Children's is a fertility program that advises uh, children and their families about the risks uh, to, uh, to fertility for, for treatment, as well as provide options options uh, to preserve uh, fertility in the future. And, you know, when you think about it, it's not directly related to, you know, how the child will do through their cancer therapy. But our goal is to preserve life and quality of life. And when you think about the goals that many people have, it's, you know, to grow up and to, to have a family of their own. And of course, there are many ways to start a family that don't require bi biological uh, ability to, to have children, uh, but many people still want to, to preserve those options or to give themselves a chance. And so what we are building is a program to um, uh, understand the impacts as well as to um, potentially uh, collaborate with other institutions so that we have the newest um, opportunities to, um, to, to uh, preserve fertility in the future. We're seeing a lot of this coming out of Europe um, and we're excited to join some uh, really exciting trials in, in the near future here. And another thing that our families have asked for, of course, we always talk to our families, are always listening to our families, and they are interested in additional ways to um, combat the, the pain, anxiety, fear, even nausea that comes along with treatment. And what we've done is we've um, contracted with a, a nationally respected uh, naturopathic physician uh, to help us build an integrative medicine program here at Children's Wisconsin. And from what our research is, is that we, within uh, our pediatric hematology oncology transplant section, um, we have an integrative medicine program. And that is the first in the country that we can find so that we are uh, learning um, the best of Western and Eastern medicine and combining it together for the best experience for our patients. Right now we are offering acupressure. So our kids get enough needles. <laughs> they don't need additional needles and acupuncture. Um, but we do know that acupressure can also um, uh, calm uh, uh, pressure points and uh, induce a reduction in pain and anxiety and nausea. So we are already doing that, uh, both for our patients that are hospitalized as well as the patients who come to clinic. Um, and it's incredible. So we're planning some research, we're just gathering our pilot data right now, um, but it'll be really interesting to see how these therapies can help us reduce use of you know, narcotics or opioids that also come with their own challenges as well. Um, and with that, uh, we also are, are taking to, to 
the first step into uh, uncharted waters in integrative nutrition support. So we're actually training some of our own clinical dietitians who work here and support our patients already um, in other integrative uh, nutrition practices. So it's a national certification, takes two years. So we're starting to do that, but there'll be a lot of um, both clinical benefit as well as research that will come out of that. So additional programs to be excited about. And I will stop since it is 1057, Becky. <laughs> We thank you both for, for joining us today and giving us such a phenomenal update on what is going on, the kids, the families, the research, the labs, um, COVID. Um, I, I know you both have a ton going on, so we are extremely grateful, as I'm sure everybody that has joined us um, to hear what is actually what is going on and the support that the MAC Fund continues to give Children's Wisconsin and, and the Medical College of Wisconsin. So thank you both very much um, for everything, for our, for our partnership. We are very, very grateful. And two, thank you for everybody joining us, um, all of your help, all of your support. Um, we can't do this without you. We can't continue the, the research, uh, help these kids live long, uh, prosperous lives without the continued support um, of donations and engagement in our uh, e events and uh, everything that everybody does to help the MAC fund uh, move forward. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank and you and also very, very much because we, we can have some of these ideas but we cannot do it without this whole team working together and very appreciative. And we're excited about all the new people that you're helping us bring on because they are the future of what will happen. And we can thank only you. do this with the support of the MAC fund and the community. So As we always so say, it, thank you. It, it's teamwork, it, it's hope, and we're all here for one thing, and, and that is helping the kids. So That's grateful good. as always. Thank, thank you, um, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you, Lauren, for taking the time. Um, and thank um, everybody that has joined us. Um, happy Monday, and uh, have a great week. And as always, if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to me. And if it is for Dr. Schwartz or Lauren Giuliani, I will be happy to pass those questions along too and get an answer back to you. Yep, we're always willing to help in any way we can. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.